All right, guys, so we have finished our first unit that we've done through uh, distance learning, so we finished covering electricity. I just want to let you guys know, I think you've been doing a really good job at keeping up with things, you know, keeping up with the work. I know it's not easy when uh, you're at home and you're not seeing us every day and we're not reminding you to turn things in, but overall I've been happy with how you guys have been doing. Um, so we're going to start moving into magnetism. This is what we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks, um, and we're going to be doing things the same way we have been. So you're going to get the narrated PowerPoints, narrated homework solutions and problem solutions, um, all the things that we, we think have been working pretty well and we've been getting good feedback on. Um, so as we talk about magnetism, I just want to warn you guys, magnetism and electricity, which we were just learning, are two very closely related topics. So as we learn about magnetism, you're going to need to remember all the stuff that we learned for electricity. So we're still going to be talking about charges, we're still going to be talking about electric fields, electric currents. Um, those two things are very closely related. So we took the test on electricity, you can't just forget all of that. You're going to still need to know it. And if we actually look at this picture here that we have on this front slide, um, this is something that sort of involves both magnetism and uh, electricity. So this is a cyclotron, which is something that accelerates particles, um, you know, protons, electrons, charged particles. And you can see we have these two Ds on the uh, top and bottom here that, um, you know, we have these two Ds here that have a magnetic field within them. And that's causing the uh, charged particle to make these turns. And then we have an electric field in the center here that is accelerating the particle. So we will talk a little bit more and uh, you guys will probably learn why it's moving the way it is as we go through this unit. Um, but this is just a good example of something where you have both magnetic fields and electric fields. So you're not going to be able to just forget the things that we were just doing. Alright, so like I said, this unit is going to be magnetism. So we're just going to start off by talking about some magnets and magnetic fields. Uh, some of this stuff might be review for you guys. You might know a little bit about magnets already, um, which if you do, it's great. Just use this to review it. Um, if you don't, definitely pay attention because this is sort of some of the basic information about magnets that you're going to need as we go through magnetism. Um, so the first thing we're going to look at is that magnets always have two ends or two poles, which is just two words for the same thing. The two poles are the two ends um, that we call north and south. And then the second thing is that like poles repel and unlike poles attract. So this is actually the same rules that we had for um, charges and charges attracting repel, right? Uh, similar, uh, similar repel, opposites attract. So hopefully that'll make it a little bit easier because it's sort of the same rule. So if we look at our three pictures here, in the first one we have the two north poles uh, close to each other, so those are going to repel. In the second picture, we have two south poles close together, so those are also similar poles, so those are going to repel. And then in this bottom picture, we have north and south together, so those are opposite poles, so those will attract. All right, but something that's important to know about magnets and that you might not realize at first is that if you cut a magnet in half, you don't end up with a north pole and a south pole. Um, what you get is two smaller magnets that both have their own north and south. Um, so like if we look at this first magnet here up at the top, it has a north pole and a south pole. And you might think that if you cut that, you just have one north magnet and one south magnet, but you can never have just one or the other in magnets. So if you break this down the center, what you actually have is two um, magnets that are half the length that both have their own north and south pole. And if you see, if you just keep breaking it down, you're just going to keep getting smaller and smaller magnets. Alright, and then to look at magnetic fields, um, we use something called magnetic field lines to visualize magnetic fields. Um, so you can think about these very similar to how we thought about electric field lines, where basically these give you an idea of which way the field is pointing at any given point. Um, and if you look at sort of how many lines there are, that sort of indicates how strong the uh, field is. Um, so for magnetic fields, the field lines are always going to be closed loops going from north to south. So you can see all of these lines, the arrows are pointing from north to south. Um, 
and this is just sort of what a magnetic field is going to look like. Okay, so if we look at this slide, we can see um, the Earth's magnetic field, and you can see that it's actually very similar to that of a bar magnet. Um, so if we look at this picture here on the bottom right, this is basically if we just sort of replace the Earth with a giant bar magnet, that's what the magnetic field lines look like going from north to south, from the magnetic north to south. Um, and that's like a very good approximation of what our Earth's magnetic field looks like and how it behaves. Um, so that's like a good way to think about the Earth's magnetic field. Um, important to note is that the Earth's north pole, um, or what we would usually call the north pole, is actually a south magnetic pole. And um, the north ends of magnets are attracted towards our north pole because it's magnetically a south pole. And then also interesting to look at here is that the magnetic poles aren't perfectly aligned with our geographic poles. So the geographic poles is sort of where our true north would be, but there's actually a declination angle between that and the actual angles of our magnetic fields. Um, so this picture sort of should help you visualize it, but they're sort of offset by uh, this, you know, fairly slight angle here. All right, and then just a quick look here at a uniform magnetic field. Um, so any uniform magnetic field just means it's constant in magnitude and direction. Um, so this is a similar concept as when we're looking at uniform uh, electric fields. So should be pretty familiar to you guys. Um, but we have this field here between two wide poles and it's nearly uniform. As you can see pretty much in the whole middle section, it's pretty much perfectly straight line with the same strength all through the center. Um, at the edges, it's very slightly off from uniform. Um, but this is sort of how you get uniform fields is in sort of situations like this. And uniform fields are very um, useful, generally speaking, because you know you have the same field everywhere. Um, so it makes sort of your math a lot easier. And so we're going to spend a lot of time doing problems that use mag uniform magnetic fields. All right, now that we're looking at our next slide, um, I know I told you guys that electricity and electric currents aren't going to go away, and this is one of the reasons why. Um, it's because electric currents produce magnetic fields. This is something that's been shown uh, experimentally all the time. Basically, any electric current will produce a magnetic field. So if we look in these two pictures here um, at the bottom, we can see this wire that's standing vertically with current moving up the page and is producing a magnetic field. That's what these blue lines are going counterclockwise around the wire. So the way you can know what direction the uh, magnetic field is going to go for a current um, is using something called the right hand rule and that's what this picture on the right is showing. But basically what you do is you take your right hand and you point your thumb in the direction of the electric current. So in this case I'm going to point my thumb up and the way that your hands and your fingers are curling around is the direction of the magnetic field. So if I just turn this up here so this is my thumb, and you can see that it's going in a counterclockwise direction, which is how these magnetic fields on the slide, um, how they got those directions. Right? And if you look at the hand in the picture, they have their thumb pointing in the direction of the current, and their fingers are curling around the wire in the same direction the magnetic field is. So that's sort of the first way we're going to use the right hand rule. Um, sometimes you look a little goofy, sort of moving your hand all, all over the place, but that's sort of the best way to get the directions for these. Um, and we're going to talk more about the right hand rule as we keep moving forward. All right, and looking a little bit more at currents producing magnetic fields, like I was just explaining, the direction of the field is given by the right hand rule. Um, but in this case, you can see a loop, so a uh, circular wire with current flowing through it. And you see they're using the right hand rule the same way we just explained. Uh, their thumb is on the wire in the pointing in the direction of the current. And so the way their fingers are going shows which way the magnetic field is. Um, and so interesting for a loop like this is that no matter where you put your hand on the wire, the magnetic field is always going to be pointing through the loop in one direction. Um, and then it will be going the opposite direction outside the loop. So even if you put your right hand on the bottom of the wire, um, the magnetic field would still be pointing from left to right inside of the loop. So basically when you use a wire like this, 
you get this whole middle area with the magnetic field pointing in one direction. Okay, so we just talked about an electric current creating a magnetic field, um, but sort of in the opposite direction, you can also, if you already have a magnetic field, create a force on an electric current. Um, so if you look at our pictures here, we have a magnet that exerts a force on a current carrying wire, and you get the direction of that force by the right hand rule. Um, so this is actually a slightly different right hand rule than the one we just learned for the last couple of slides. Um, but if you're trying to get the force on a wire created by a magnetic field, the way you do it is you point your fingers in the direction of the current, then you bend your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field, and your thumb will be pointing in the direction of the force. So if we look at this picture on the left here, we have current going into the screen, so I'm going to take my right hand and point my fingers into the screen. Um, then we have a magnetic field going to the right, so I'm going to turn my hand so that when I bend my fingers, they go to the right and my thumb will give the direction of the force, which is down. Um, so that's how you get the direction of a force created by a magnetic field on an electric current. Um, right, so you point your fingers of your right hand in the direction of the current, you bend them in the direction of the field, and your thumb will point in the direction of the force. And if you try that for this second picture, you should find that the force points up Right, so you're going to want to point your right hand sort of um, out of the screen or out of the paper, uh, then bend your fingers to the right, and your thumb should be pointing up when you do that. Okay, so now we know how to find the direction of a force on an electric current in a magnetic field, um, but that's not all we want to know. We also want to know the magnitude, how strong that force is. And so this is the equation we're going to use for that. Um, I know it is the 10th slide, so you guys have probably all been waiting for an equation to pop up, and here it is. You're going to have to be ready to use this one. And what this equation is telling us is that the force on a wire, so that's our F here, uh, depends on the current I, the length of the wire, which is an L, and the magnetic field, which is our capital B here, and then its orientation, so the direction of the magnetic field and the current relative to each other. Um, so basically this sine theta, this theta here is the angle between the direction of the current and the direction of the magnetic field. Um, and you should um, get better at identifying what that angle is once you're actually looking at problems. Um, but this equation will be used to define the magnetic field B. Um, and I think just something to point out really quickly is this sine theta for certain angles is really easy. So if they're 90 degrees, so if they're perfectly perpendicular to each other, sine theta is just one. So for the, if um, your current and your magnetic field are at a perfect right angle, then the force is just equal to the current times the length times the magnetic field strength. So that equation gets really easy. And then actually even easier than that is if your current and your magnetic field are pointing in the same direction. So if the two directions are exactly the same, the angle between them is zero. So the sine of zero is zero, so anytime they're pointing in the same direction, the force is going to be zero. There will be no force. Um, so those are two special cases that make the math a lot easier. Um, so if we ever give you something where the current and the magnetic field are pointing in the exact same direction, and you just say, cool, I don't even have to do any math, that's just zero force. Um, which is really nice and it can simplify a lot of problems. All right, and then something we need to talk about whenever we have new, uh, new things we're looking at, new formulas, is units. Um, so whenever we're measuring magnetic fields, our unit of B, which is the letter we're using for magnetic field, is the Tesla, which is symbolized by a capital T. And one Tesla is equal to one Newton divided by an ampere times a meter. So one Newton over amperes times meters, um, right? So when we have a derived unit like this, I know I've probably said this a hundred times now, but whenever we have a derived unit, it means you're going to have to convert things to base units before you put them into that equation we just got. So you have to make sure your force is in Newtons, you have to make sure your current's in amperes, and you have to make sure your distance or your length is in meters, um, or else you won't get the right answer in Teslas. Um, another unit that sometimes gets used, um, less commonly, but it does get used here and there, is the Gauss. 
uh, which we use a capital G for, and 1G is equal to 10 to the minus 4th Teslas. So that's how you would convert between those two. All right, and after looking at forces on currents in a magnetic field, now we can look at the force on an electric charge moving in a magnetic field. So the force on a moving charge uh, is related to the force on a current, so this formula should look somewhat familiar to you. Um, but for a moving charge, it's F equals QVB sine theta. So basically, we're just uh, replacing that IL with a QV. Um, so the force is equal to the charge, so Q, Q is our charge, V, which is the velocity of that charge, B, or the strength of our magnetic field, and then multiplied by sine theta, with theta being the um, angle between our velocity and our magnetic field in this case. Um, so once again, you get the direction by the right hand rule, and this will work pretty similarly to our last one. Um, so in this case, you point your fingers in the direction of the um, moving charge, so in the direction of velocity. Then you bend your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field, and your thumb will point in the direction of force. So if we look at our picture here, we have a, um, two particles going into the screen. So I'm going to take my right hand again and point it into the screen. And then our magnetic field is going to the right, so I'm going to turn my hand so that my fingers bend to the right. And then my thumb points in the direction of a force on a char positive charge. So my thumb is pointing down, and so that means this positive Q, uh, this charge with a positive charge, is going to get forced down, as you can see in the picture. Um, for a negative charge, it's going to move in the opposite direction, so it's going to move up. Um, so the right hand rule is going to tell you the direction of the force on a positive charge. A negative charge will move the opposite way. Okay, and so for an electric charge moving in a uniform magnetic field, um, if it's moving perpendicular, the path it follows is actually going to be a circle. So if we look at our picture here, um, these blue X's are the magnetic field. Generally, if we have fields going in and out of the page, um, we use an X as... Um, a magnetic field pointing into the page and we'll use like a circle with a dot in it for a magnetic field pointing out of the page so in this case our B field is pointing into the page or into the screen um, and so as a charged particle moves into that field it's going to move and follow a circle like this um, and that's sort of why when we looked on that first page with the cyclotron why those magnetic fields are used to uh, turn the uh, charged particle around, right, as it causes a circular motion. So you can use this to turn a particle, you can use it to turn a proton or electron or anything with a charge. All right, and just three things to remember while you're working on problems, while you're working on the homeworks and the do nows and things like that, um, about problems with magnetic fields. First is that the magnetic force is always going to be perpendicular to the magnetic field direction. Um, always going to be perpendicular. Second, you use the right hand rule to find the directions of things. Um, and then third, the equation in this chapter only give magnitudes and then you use the right hand rule to get the direction. Right, so the, those equations that we've shown you so far, that's what you use to get how strong a force is, but you have to use the right hand rule to figure out which direction the force is acting in. Um, and then hopefully these make sense uh, they might not come supernatural to you guys at first. The right hand rule can be sort of weird until you get used to it. Um, but as you do the homeworks, as you do the do right nows and sort of the daily problems and stuff like that, um, you'll get used to it and it'll get pretty easy. Um, and I don't think it'll be that bad in the long run. All right, and on this slide, we have a diagram of all three of the right hand rules you might need to use. Um, so I talked about each of these as they came up and as we sort of talked about the situation where they'd be useful. But if you're working on your homeworks and you need to sort of just check how to use the right hand rule, this page is going to be a really good reference for you guys. So first we have the magnetic field produced by a current, in which case you wrap your fingers around the wire with your thumb pointing in the direction of the current, and then your fingers give you the direction of the magnetic field. Second, you have the force on a current due to a magnetic field. 
And in this case, you point your fingers in the direction of the current, bend them in the direction of the magnetic field, and then your thumb points in the direction of the force. And then finally, we have a force on an electric charge due to a magnetic field. In this case, you point your fingers in the direction of the velocity of the charge, you bend your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field, and your thumb gives you the force again. So this page is a really good reference as you're working on the problems and just to make sure you get all your directions right. And then here we can see something called a solenoid. Um, and what that is is a long coil of wire where you have a current running through it. And for a tightly wrapped solenoid, the magnetic field in its interior is very close to being perfectly uniform. Um, so basically, if you use the right hand rule based on the current, you'd see that all of these loops all are going to have their current pointing from left to right through the center of this coil. And so when all those loops add together, you end up with this area in the middle of the coil that has a very, very close to uniform magnetic field. And this is something that's very useful in, um, in science when you're trying to do experiments, when you're trying to do things where you want a uniform magnetic field. Um, this is something that gets used a lot. Alright, and so something you guys may have heard of at some point is an electromagnet. And what that basically is, is you take a piece of iron or something very magnetic and you insert it inside of a solenoid. And what this does is it greatly increases the strength of the electric field. Um, so electromagnets have a lot of practical applications, but if we just look at this one right here on the slide real quick, um, at the beginning the switch is open so there's no current so we don't have a magnetic field or anything. Um, but we have this iron rod with a spring and we have a bell on the right. And so as soon as you close this wire you're going to have current flowing. Um, right, That's sort of what we were just learning about with circuits. And once you have current flowing, you're going to be creating this uh, electromagnet, and it's going to ring the bell. So basically, if you hit the switch and turn it on, you can hit the uh, ring the bell. All right, we're just going to take a quick look at a couple of sort of real-world applications of magnetism and these forces we've been talking about. Um, so the first one we're going to look at is an electric motor. And basically, that takes advantage of the torque on a current loop to change electrical energy into mechanical energy. Um, and if that doesn't sort of fully explain it for you, we're going to look at this picture here on the right real quick. Um, so basically you have this wire with an electric current running through it from plus to minus, and you have it in this, right inside of this magnet here where we have the north on the left and the south on the right. And so we know that a current carrying wire in a magnetic field is going to experience a force. And so this left-hand side, or the left-hand side on our picture here, is experiencing a force going um, up that way, as it's shown in the picture. At the other end, the force is going in the other way. And so what those forces do is spin the armature. So basically, you're taking this electrical energy that's creating this current, and you're using it to, uh, since it's in a magnetic field, it's going to create a force spinning this armature. And now you have mechanical energy in the motion, um, the rotational motion of the armature. All right, so another use of magnetic forces is in loudspeakers. Um, so they use the principle that a mag magnet will exert a force on a current carrying wire, just like we were just talking about, um, to convert electrical signals into mechanical vibrations producing sound. Um, so if we look at our diagram here, we have this lead-in wire, so we're carrying a uh, current that goes into a coil of wire which is attached to the speaker cone, and we have them inside of this magnet here. So we know that any current carrying wire in a magnetic field is going to experience a force, so whenever you have current running through these wires, um, that's going to create a force which will create a mechanical vibration, and that's how we produce the sounds in a loudspeaker. All right, and then the last thing we're going to talk just a little bit about is ferromagnetism. So this is going to be the last few slides in this PowerPoint. Um, so ferromagnetic materials are those that become strongly magnetized. Um, some examples are iron and nickel, but generally most of the things that you think of as being magnetic are probably ferromagnetic materials. Um, so these are made up of tiny regions called domains, and the magnetic field in each domain is going to be in a single direction. Um, so on this slide, this is just sort of the basic 
definition of a ferromagnet. Um, the second part is going to be easier to visualize on the next slide because we'll have pictures to go along with it. So then looking at the pictures of a ferromagnet here on the right, we can see these areas that we call domains, so these separate areas, and within each domain the magnetic field is going to be pointing in a certain direction. Um, so when the material is unmagnetized, the domains can be randomly ordered, um, right? They're pointing sort of just in whatever direction. Um, but if you place these, this magnetic material in an external magnetic field, these magnetic fields will line up with it. So if you place them in an external magnetic field, you can either partially or fully align all of these domains so that the magnetic fields are all pointing in one direction and then the ferromagnet will be um, magnetized. And then just a couple of last things to say about ferromagnetism before we are done with this PowerPoint. Um, first, a magnet, if undisturbed, will tend to retain its magnetism. Um, it can be demagnetized by shock or heat, but basically, if you just leave a magnet alone, it will stay sort of um, magnetized in the same way it was. Um, it takes sort of some external something to make it change. And then second is just that the relationship between the external magnetic field and the internal field in a ferromagnet is not simple as the magnetization can vary. Um, so basically you can't just look at one and feel like you know the other. It's pretty complicated. Um, but I don't think we're going to worry too much about that.